This is a talk on why Minesweeper is hard. A very simple talk, you know, uh, just Minesweeper. Uh, nothing else in here. Uh, there's no underlying complexity whatsoever. It's going to be a really simple, straightforward talk. Uh, so, for the uninitiated, uh, Minesweeper at its heart is a very simple game. Uh, you want to discover as much of the board as possible uh, without stepping on any mines. So, you should mark these squares with a flag instead. Uh, there are two main pieces of information given to you. The first is the number of mines remaining in the top left. Uh, and the second is a number of uh, is a number on each revealed square, uh, representing how many mines are on the surrounding eight squares. Uh, so here you can see the two, so there are two mines in the adjacent eight squares. Uh, so from this configuration, uh, we can pretty easily work out uh, that in the top left, I've just zoomed in here, uh, there is a mine uh, right at that location. Now, uh, Minesweeper is a game that's existed for a long time, uh, and that means it's existed long enough for people to get very, very good at it. Still, though, Minesweeper, you know, it's kind of hard. I'm sure that if you played it before, you probably messed up a bunch of games. But what about the experts? Uh, this here is the expert grid. It's a 30 by 16 monster with like 99 bombs. So let's say you want to get good at Minesweeper. You want to become an expert. So, you know, you buy a readily available 3090 graphics card uh, to get the best FPS while you're playing Minesweeper. Uh, and then you can just start clicking away. Uh, after, you know, some hard work and dedication, you know, you start getting good, uh, really good at Minesweeper. And eventually, uh, you're literally this guy right here. Uh, you're literally the best Minesweeper player in the world. Now, what's the probability of winning at Minesweeper if you're the best player in the world? If you play perfectly, uh, you can get that as high as 50%. Ish. Uh, okay, maybe. Uh, the, the truth is we don't actually know. Uh, that 50% figure is actually just estimated because we ran a few simulations on it. Uh, but wait, why don't we know? I mean, surely we've got a large mice we grid right here. Uh, can't we just check? Just check the possibilities. Well, let's see. Uh, we have a 30 by 16 board, so that's 480 tiles. Uh, the first uncovered square is always safe, so you don't have to worry about that. And uh, there are 99 total mines to flag, so that is 479 choose 99, which is... Ah! Alright, I think I see the problem. So it looks like we have to check this many boards. Uh, good news, it gets worse. Uh, we also have to deal with the what's called the Minesweeper consistency problem. So if we look at this configuration here, uh, we've used all the available information that we have, um, and we're still stuck. So for each of the pairs that are highlighted in yellow, uh, we're going to have to guess between them, uh, potentially up to three times in a row, uh, and that kind of reduces your odds, so that's like 12.5%. Uh, oh no, that's not good. <laughs> so that's at most a 50% chance of actually winning the game. In this case, it isn't actually a 50-50 split. So if we take a look at the uh, tile to the top right of uh, the six, uh, this has a two-thirds chance of actually being a mine. Uh, the reason for that is if we consider all possibilities of where the mines could be, it just happens to be there more often than it isn't. So the probabilities aren't actually that simple to calculate. We have a less than 66% chance of actually getting it right. Uh, and also, inconsistencies aren't always obvious. So what about this grid? Uh, is, it, is it consistent? Uh, you know, you feel free to pause and try to explore it yourself. Now, although it might not seem like it at first, it's possible to actually deduce where we can place another flag. Uh, so consider the following number. Uh, from this, we can see that exactly one of these two adjacent squares must be a mine. Uh, as a result, if we consider the number below, uh, then exactly one of these three adjacent squares must be a mine. Uh, finally, if we consider the number to the left, uh, there must be a mine in this position. So we can actually reveal both of these tiles. Uh, we don't have to guess here. We've just learned that Minesweeper is not only hard, it's unfairly hard. You're not even guaranteed to win, and to top it all off, we can't even work out exactly how likely you are to win. Uh, so, <laughs> the question is, can we just make it consistent? I mean, surely we can just generate a board that just happens to work better, uh, that improves Minesweeper. Like, surely that's possible. Let's have a quick aside. Uh, just something completely unrelated, and talk about the complexity classes P and MP. First, let's talk about P. Uh, this is the class of problems that can be solved in polynomial time. Uh, on the right, you can see our use of uh, big annotation. And without going into too much detail, we can say that an algorithm uh, that takes the number of steps given by, say, this formula, uh, can really just be described as big O, n to the 8. So as n becomes large, the terms with small powers and all the coefficients become pretty much irrelevant because the function can be bounded by some constant times n to the power of 8. 
Uh, there can also be some inputs, which the algorithm is slightly slower or faster, but the point is that the time scales in a polynomial way to the input size. We also have NP, or non-deterministic polynomial time. This is the class of all problems that, given some polynomial amount of information to work with, for each instance of the problem, we can give a yes answer in polynomial time. So, we often call this extra information we get given an oracle or a certificate that we can verify. In practice, however, NP problems tend to take uh, k to the n time, so here k is fixed and n varies. So that's exponential, rather than n to the power of k, which is polynomial. So if you had a problem that took 2 to the n time to solve, uh, well that means, well, if fn equals 5, that's 32, not too big. Uh, if n equals 25, that's 33 million, kind of big, but still doable. Uh, and if n equals 250, uh, then, uh, oh, oh, that's another big number. Uh, and just to nail down how bad this is, if we have an input of size n equals 1000, then the number of digits I would have to write down to display the output number would be larger than the number of atoms in the universe. Uh, this is why I personally like to call problems with these sorts of time complexities, uh, oh, heat death of the universe. Now, p is fairly obviously contained within mp. If a problem can be solved in polynomial time, then it can definitely be solved in polynomial time with additional information, uh, because we never really needed it in the first place. Uh, that leaves us with, quite literally, uh, the million dollar question. Uh, what about the other way around? Is NP contained within P? This seems like a weird question, so I'm going to try to explain this rough concept in a very strange way, not entirely accurate, uh, but a strange way. Let's imagine that you want to cook something to eat. So you buy a bunch of ingredients at your local supermarket, you put them all down together on the kitchen counter, and like any reasonable student, realize you have literally no idea what you're doing. So, you know, uh, let's say you have uh, an egg, you know, you've got, you got a pan, that, that usually helps. Uh, we've got some cheese, uh, ham, uh, and also a chicken, just, just a live chicken. Um, now you're probably thinking, this doesn't seem like a proper student kitchen, and you're right, it's too clean. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, you haven't got all the time in the world, uh, so you crack out the, uh, the fifth edition student cookbook, uh, that your parents gave you before you came to uni, and you flip to a random page. So now you know exactly what ingredients to use and in what order. Phew. Um, so, in a sense, it's kind of what it means for a problem to be an MP. So it's able to access a polynomial of information handed to it, an oracle if you will, and use that to solve a problem in polynomial time. Uh, in this case, it's giving you the ingredients you need to use to eat, and in what order you need to add them, in a sense. But then, a question pops into your mind. Did you ever really need the cookbook in the first place? I mean, you might not have all the time in the world's bear, but maybe there's some reasonably effective way at finding a dish that works on your own. You may be thinking, well, of course there are some combinations that are going to work, for example, like, you know, using an egg to make an omelette. You can figure that out, right? You don't need a cookbook for that. But, what if we were actually in a parallel dimension where we've just thrown all the known rules of cooking right out of the window? Maybe it's not a great idea anymore to crack open that egg. What if a tentacle pops out and just eats you or something? Um, <laughs> my point is, uh, it's not so easy to see that NP is contained within P when we're not given access to some probably crucial information we were given access to before. So, in order to answer this question, we first need to ask, is there a notion of the hardest problem in NP? This would have to be so hard that we, if we could show that it could be solved in polynomial time, then every other problem in MP could also be solved in polynomial time. Uh, and then we're done. Uh, in fact, there is such a problem, uh, and it's called SAT. Uh, we're given a Boolean formula, uh, which has n variables, and this is generally given in what we call conjunctive normal form. So this consists of a number of positive or negative literals, so either a variable or some negation, and these are all joined together by ORs, to form a clause. Then all of these clauses are anded together. Now, the problem is, is there some assignment of true or false to each of these variables, such that the formula evaluates the true? In other words, is there a satisfying assignment, sat? As it turns out, all the other MP problems can be encoded in the form of this problem, and this was proven in 1971 with the cook levin theorem. But wait, there's more. That's not the only MP-complete problem. We can actually reduce it further to find other problems that, if solved in polynomial time, would mean that all NP problems can be solved in polynomial time. Uh, we would first have to show that such a problem is a member of NP, and then that it reduces in polynomial time from an existing NP complete problem. For example, we can reduce SAT to what's called 3SAT, it's a version with at most three literals in each clause, 
uh, which we can then reduce to subset sum. So we're given a set of numbers, and we have to determine if you can sum up a group of them to a specific total. So this is just as hard as set. The tree of all known MP complete reductions is of course a hell of a lot bigger than this. Uh, finally, I want to briefly mention co-NP. It's basically the same definition as MP, but with one key difference. Instead of being able to verify yes instances in polynomial time, we can instead of verify no instances in polynomial time. One example would be to determine whether a formula is not satisfiable, with a no instance being to show that it is. And as you might expect, a problem is co-NP complete if all other problems in co-NP can be encoded in it. Of course, this raises another question. Is MP equal to co-NP? Well, we don't know that either. Uh, so it's fair to say that there are three possible outcomes here. Uh, the first is the boring one, where P is equal to MP, which obviously means that MP is equal to co-MP. Uh, another slightly more interesting outcome is that P and MP aren't equal, but MP is equal to co-MP. And finally, we have the very fun world, where nothing is equal and now our diagram is all over the place. Um, and that is the end of the aside. Uh, now you may be wondering, why did I just do that? We were just talking about consistency here. Well, as it turns out, uh, for the player, uh, solving this problem of my sweep consistency uh, is actually co-NP complete. And for the developer, uh, solving the problem of my sweep consistency happens to be NP complete. So the player can't solve it, and the developer can't solve it. Yay! So I guess we just can't solve it then? Minesweeper isn't just hard, it's NP hard. Uh, that's great and all, but why not just generate the Minesweeper grid so it's always consistent? So, you know, for example, you generate a subset of the grid such that you always know they're going to be consistent. You can't generate all of these because that would be intractable. That's just looping back around to the same problem we had in the first place. Uh, if you do this, you will be, albeit indirectly, uh, fundamentally changing the rules of the game. So determining what is and what isn't consistent it is the MP complete part. But restricting ourselves to a subset of what is consistent using a polynomial time approximation has the side effect of making it easier for players to exploit the not so random anymore map generation. So depending on how you decide to do this, it could also potentially make things almost trivial to solve. You know, just put the bombs around the edge. That's a generated grid, isn't it? Uh, it's not really interesting to play, though. That's kind of a bummer. So instead, let's focus on something else. What if we make the Minesweeper grid bigger? So this is quite big, it's quite a big grid. But but no, no, we want, we want bigger. Uh, this is quite big. No, no, I want bigger. I want, I want infinitely bigger. Why did we just make the Minesweeper grid bigger? Um, well, the reason is, uh, Minesweeper isn't just hard, uh, it's powerfully hard. And to show you what I mean, let's imagine that we have an infinite Minesweeper grid. Uh, we can now make what I like to call uh, a Minesweeper wire. Now, this exploits the consistency problem. So imagine that all the way over infinitely to the left we have the same pattern repeated, and all the way over infinitely to the right we have the same pattern repeated. So because of how the rules of the game work, if any of the squares marked x uh, has a mine, then all of the squares marked x have a mine. So similarly, this holds true for the ones that are marked x prime, but only one of the x or x prime squares will have mines. In a way, this replicates the behaviour of a Boolean variable, x or not x. On a completely unrelated note, we can also form a Minesweeper NOT gate. So as we pass from left to right here, the order of x and x prime actually flip. They're forced to flip. So they effectively negate the, the Boolean variable, if you will. Uh, you can probably see where this is going. We have, uh, brace yourselves, uh, an AND gate. So what this does is it takes in some Minesweeper wire U from above and some Minesweeper wire V from below. And then after all this magical wizardry going on here, we finally get the AND of the two variables, as what pops out on the other side, uh, in a new variable, W. And I'll just let you stare at that for a bit longer. <laughs> it's, it's quite big, isn't it? Um, the, uh, the, the B1, B2, B3, A1, A2, A3, uh, the other variables don't really matter too much. It's mainly the U's, the V's, and in this case, the T's. Now you might know that a NOT gate and an AND gate can make an AND gate. You also might have heard of an AND gate before. I'm pretty sure that, you know, you know, computers, right? They're actually made, if you really go down to the heart of a computer, uh, they're actually just made of NAND gates. And in fact, they're quite cheap to produce, because NAND gates can be used to produce any other logic gate. And knowing this, because computers are made using NAND gates, could it be that a computer is actually equivalent to an infinite Minesweeper grid? 
If you put all the input variables encoded in binary on the left, and we have all the outputs also encoded in binary on the right, then, really, Infinite Minesweeper is what we call Turing Complete. It can simulate anything that a computer could possibly simulate itself. So in truth, a Minesweeper good that is large enough is just as powerful as any computer. So, thanks for bearing with me, and I'd be happy to answer any questions.